Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we look at the NICE guideline on cardiovascular risk reduction and lipid modification, or NG238, which was published in December 2023, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. In this episode, we're going to cover cardiovascular risk assessment, recommendations for specialist referral, and considerations before starting starting therapy. Stay tuned because in the next episode we will cover the rest of the guideline, including primary and secondary prevention, assessing response to treatment, optimizing therapy, and what to do when statins are contraindicated or not tolerated. If you'd like a refresher on the NICE guidance on cardiac chest pain and the management of stable angina, please refer to the corresponding episodes on this channel. The links are also in the episode description. Right, let's jump into it. For people without established cardiovascular disease, we're now advised to use QRISC-3 instead of QRISC-2 to calculate the cardiovascular risk within the next 10 years. We will do this for those aged between 25 and 84, including those with type 2 diabetes, because QRISC-2 is currently embedded in the electronic clinical systems that most of us use in the UK, NICE accepts that until the clinical software systems are updated with QRIS-3, it may be necessary to continue using QRIS-2. However, when assessing cardiovascular risk for people taking steroids or atypical antipsychotics, or people with SNE, migraine, erectile dysfunction or severe mental illness, we are advised to use the online version of QRIS-3 because QRIS-2 does not take these risk factors into account and may underestimate the risk. A link to the online version of QRIS-3 is in the episode description. So what's the difference between QRISC-2 and QRISC-3? When QRISC-3 was introduced in 2017 as an update to QRISC-2, and it includes all the factors in QRISC-2, but adds new risk factors to make it more accurate. These factors are some medications which are known to increase cardiovascular risk, such as atypical antipsychotics and corticosteroids, some diagnoses which have been linked to increased cardiovascular risk, such as chronic inflammatory conditions, for example SLE, severe mental illness understood as a diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder or other psychosis, migraine and erectile dysfunction, and examination findings such as considering systolic blood pressure variability because fluctuations in blood pressure have been found to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. This means that even if someone's average blood pressure is normal, large swings in the systolic pressure over time can increase the cardiovascular risk. Is there anyone that is not suitable for the Q-Risk assessment tool? Well, we should not use it for those who are already at high risk of cardiovascular disease, including people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, that is, secondary prevention, familial hypercholesterolemia, type 1 diabetes, CKD, that is either an EGFR less than 60, and or albuminuria, and finally those aged 85 and older. As we know, we are advised to use QRIS-3 in people aged 25 to 84, so we should not use it for those aged 85 and older but instead we should consider them to be at increased risk of cardiovascular disease because of age alone. In addition, there are certain cardiovascular risk factors that are not fully considered in the assessment tools, like for example, people treated for HIV or with drugs that can cause dyslipidemia, such as for example, immunosuppressants. Although we should offer patients information about their cardiovascular risk within the next 10 years, we should also consider using a lifetime risk tool, such as QRISC-3 Lifetime, to inform discussions and to motivate lifetime changes, particularly for people with a 10-year QRISC-3 score less than 10% and people under 40 who have cardiovascular disease risk factors. The link to the QRISC-3 Lifetime tool is in the episode description. It goes without saying that we will offer lifestyle advice for both the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in the form of healthy eating, a cardioprotective diet where saturated fats are replaced by monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats, 
increased physical activity, weight management, and smoking cessation and alcohol advice. But we will not recommend either aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease or plant stannols and sterols in any situation. For the initial lipid measurement, we should check a full lipid profile measuring both total and HDL cholesterol, as well as triglycerides. And, depending on the results, there will be situations where we should refer patients to a lipid clinic. So let's have a look at the referral recommendations. But before making a referral, we should exclude and manage possible secondary causes of dyslipidemia, such as, for example, excess alcohol, uncontrolled diabetes, hypothyroidism, liver disease and nephrotic syndrome. Right, now, once we have excluded secondary causes, we will need to refer the patient primarily for two reasons, because of suspected familial hypercholesterolemia or because of significantly raised triglycerides. Let's look at familial hypercholesterolemia first. In order to judge the likelihood of a familial lipid disorder, we are advised to consider clinical findings, a full lipid profile and family history rather than using strict lipid cutoff values alone. I have put the link to the guideline on familial hypercholesterolemia in the episode description, but in summary, we should suspect it if the total cholesterol is greater than 7.5 millimol per litre, or there is a personal or family history of premature coronary heart disease, that is, an event before 60 years in an index individual or first-degree relative. To diagnose familial hypercholesterolemia in primary care, we will need to use the Salmon Broom criteria or the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network or DLCN criteria and apply them to those who we suspect have the condition. This should be done by someone competent in using the criteria, so we should seek advice if necessary. I have put links to the criteria in the episode description. If the criteria are met, we will make a clinical diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia and we will refer them accordingly for consideration of genetic testing, familial screening and further management. However, NICE recommends direct specialist referral without having to apply this criteria. If total blood cholesterol is more than 9 millimol per litre or non-HDL cholesterol is more than 7.5 millimol per litre, and this is even in the absence of a first-degree family history of premature coronary heart disease. Let's now look at when to refer when triglycerides are significantly raised. For those with triglycerides of more than 20 millimol per litre, that is not as a result of excess alcohol intake or poor glycemic control, we will refer them for urgent specialist review. This is because such elevated levels increase the risk of acute pancreatitis. For those with triglycerides between 10 and 20 millimol per litre, we will repeat the triglycerides with a fasting test after an interval of five days, but within two weeks. And we will refer if the triglyceride level remains at more than 10 millimol per litre. Those with triglycerides between 4.5 and 9.9 millimol per litre do not necessarily need referral, but we need to be aware that cure risk may underestimate the cardiovascular risk in these cases. Right, let's assume that the patient has a high cardiovascular risk. The main way to reduce the cardiovascular risk in both primary and secondary prevention is with statins. What general information should we give to patients before starting them? We should advise that the risk of muscle pain, tenderness or weakness associated with statin use is small and the rate of severe muscle adverse effects or rhabdomyolysis because of statins is extremely low. We should also advise that other drugs, some foods, for example grapefruit juice, and some supplements may interfere with statins, and they should always check the risk of interactions when starting other drugs or thinking about taking supplements. Next, before starting statins, we should assess the patient, including smoking, alcohol, blood pressure and BMI, and perform blood tests, including a full lipid profile, fasting glucose or HbA1c, renal and liver function tests, and thyroid function tests, including TSH, 
for those with symptoms of underactive or overactive thyroid. We will not routinely exclude from statin treatment people who have high levotransaminase levels, which are less than three times the upper limit of normal. Also, before offering statin, we should ask if they have had persistent, generalized, unexplained muscle symptoms like pain, tenderness or weakness. And if so, we will measure creatine kinase levels. If creatine kinase levels are more than five times the upper limit of normal, we will recheck it after seven days. And if it is still five times the upper limit of normal, we will not start static therapy. However, if creatine kinase levels are raised, but less than five times the upper limit of normal, we can start starting treatment, but we will do so at a lower dose. We obviously need to be aware that statins are contraindicated in pregnancy and that statins should be stopped if pregnancy is a possibility, statins should be stopped three months before attempting to conceive, and statins should not be restarted until breastfeeding is finished. And that is it, an introduction to cardiovascular disease risk reduction in primary care. Make sure not to miss the next episode, where we will cover the rest of the guideline, including statins for both primary and secondary prevention. As always, remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.